was a friendship that turned into this um, this relationship that it's we're still trying to find our footing on actually and that's why we're 11 years on still trying to work out why are we together <laughs> yeah it wasn't really um a world of romance i think we Cause um... she, she was really annoying because good looking <laughs> women are annoying they're like too good looking and uh, and they come out with obnoxious, obnoxious and that's what she's my first impression of her was and when i met him i thought he was um really arrogant i was just confident stuck up you know I just and answers and just thought he knew everything. Because I read. And yeah, so basically, uh, we didn't like each other the first time we met. But No, I didn't go as far as I didn't like her. I thought I she was like attractive, her. but I just think, you know, good looking, you know, stuck up. That's all I thought. <laughs> um, yeah, but fast forward to 2009, when you saw the family, um, that was when we did our Indian wedding. So it was a really big deal for us to have our traditional llama and we wanted to do it uh, with all of the family and all of that was documented on uh, this fly in the wall documentary called The Family and Sonny's parents, my in-laws were there, Sonny's sister, Sonny's brother and Sonny's brother-in-law and his daughter. So it was a very kind of um, intimate series over eight weeks and it really showed the trials and tribulations of family highlighted the fact that although my father's family were in my life and they very much supported our marriage and relationship uh, my mother's family and my mum did not and pretty much what you saw in the family is exactly the same five years on so uh, unfortunately my mum and my mum's family are not in, in our lives in any way um, and I have to respect that and you know sometimes you just have to learn that you know not everyone is able to accept your life choices and your life partner and it's been an interesting couple of years but my father's family are amazing they've been so supportive yeah. they were all at the wedding they love sunny they we're well, actually sitting in his house yeah, yeah. yeah in my cousin's house and you know my my father's family just think i couldn't have chosen anyone better than sunny and that means a lot to me yeah she's still out i'm still what she's still deciding <laughs> what do you mean? We've been together 11 years. I know, but you always keep saying, listen, love, I'll get a younger model. You know what I mean? What's all yeah. that? Threats? He's nine years older than me, so... Okay. Mentally, I'm nine more years. mature than her. She's one year even lower. Yeah. Mentally, so ten. No, nine years That's older That's physically, than I'm me. a mentally woman. Anyway, and so we, we are very different individuals, you know, and... Um, yes, we are. Yeah. I'm a man, and she's a woman. And that's different as I wanted it to be. <laughs> Yeah, but like my dad's family love him to bits and uh, you know, all of my friends really do and that's, you know, that's really important to me. Um, before the documentary, me and Shay were, Shay, Shay was already uh, doing a journalism course and she was interested in social issues and as a result of that, she was already um, thinking that how can I, how can I apply this into my daily life and what have you. And uh, she knew that I was into radio, uh, drama and uh, cartoons and all that kind of creative side of of uh, of the arts and um, as things went on before the family turned up I said to her listen I need to go to America at some point and uh, pursue uh, a filmmaking career and she goes okay I can support that so what we started doing before the family was writing scripts for mm -hmm. radio because radio was the easiest way and the cheapest way to get your get your stories out there and show your capability to tell a story narratively with entertainment by using sound effects and what have you. And uh, as we were planning that, um, we thought, right, this is the best time now to get get on with uh, getting our, uh, you know, the Indian wedding, the, the one in the Gurdwara. So when we were planning that, that's when we were approached uh, at Jeet's play by the producers of the family. And then it just turned a completely different turn. Mm. And uh, then we met Joe Good. Mm, yeah, so the, there was, um, I think like, you know, often when you you hear stories from people who have become very successful in their personal lives or become successful in their careers, there's always like one or two people who have um, been there and supported you. And for us, that's exactly the case. So there was this one individual, her name is Jo Good, and she works at BBC London. And she just said to us, I think you two would be amazing on radio. And I don't we know why. Like, she, I don't know why she thought that. Yeah, she's yeah. so like, why would you? Because me I, and him on radio, you're just going to shout she, at each other. You're not going to listen to me. Mm -hmm. You know how would that work? And, and she's beautiful, so yeah. put her on the TV. But <laughs> you know, hiding her from like, I can understand radio for myself, but I've got a rubbish voice as well. So I, 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 I it's okay. Well, thanks, man. 
That's really nice. It's not as good as my coffee. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so basically, she was a person who encouraged us, and off the back of um, her support, we you know started doing red carpet premieres. We were interviewing people like Angelina Jolie, uh, Bradley Cooper, and what we did not know was she had some of the bosses at the BBC listen to us going on her radio show, just contributing maybe five to ten minutes once in a week. Just the interaction yeah, that we had and with we, each Yeah, they really liked the interaction and they were the individuals who offered us a pilot. And I'll never forget, when we left the pilot, I said to Sunny, I have this CD now, I can show my children and say, I did a pilot for the BBC. And I'm going to look at them and I'm going to say, right, what can you do? Not thinking anything more than that. Yeah. And, you know, fast forward four years, we've been at BBC London for four years and um, we've just joined BBC WM, which is in the Midlands. So it's it's been a real crazy whirlwind, but I think all of it did begin with that one person and we will always thank her and her name's Joe Good. And the thing is that when you look at um, now, how accessible the media is, when I was younger, there was only one route and that was go and get an education, get yourself some work experience, then try to work for the biggest corporations, people like the BBC, CNN, um, Paramount and all of those guys. So that was always my trail of thought. And even today, how much respect you get from an institution like the British Broadcasting Corporation, which is so synced in everyone's memory mm -hmm. and very much part of history across the world, to, to work for an organisation like that is just like um, a dream come true for someone like myself. Whenever I've heard the, the, that phrase, uh, you don't know what's around the corner, for me, I always think it's a negative thing, something bad's gonna happen, or you know, what we have could go or um, you know something you'd have to family you know all of those kind of things that I think anyone will think of when you say you don't know what's around the corner but the one thing I learned from 2014 is actually it's also a good thing you really don't know what is around the corner you really don't know um, you know as long as you're putting in your hard work and you are focused on what you want to do you really don't know what opportunities could come to you um, I really believe there is a little bit of element of luck in what you do and I think that's been testament to Sunny and I uh, that plus me having to put up, put up working with him because up until four years ago we didn't work together. We both had very individual separate lives, <sighs> and now I'm basically his wife and his PA. Uh, and that's okay. Why don't you tell him why you're my PA and why you're my wife? No, he just delegates everything to me. I have okay. to set up diaries. Yeah. I have to, you know, we came to LA. I had to pack and then I had to pack for him because you know he can't do that himself. Uh, I had to do everything. So uh, I I have a lot of respect. For for, I'm going to say this in the camera, a lot of respect for any personal assistance because I know, I now know how that feels. Can you tell them why again you have to do all these things? Oh yeah, here? and he's dyslexic, which he shouted about. Right. So that's just like, that's just like saying I'm looking after someone who's blind and I have to open the doors for him. No, so, that's not true. So, we'll be out for drinks then he'll turn to me and say, Shay, can you set that meeting up? And it's like, as if like a boss is talking again, to the PA. Hold on a minute, let me just get someone from behind the camera. If you want to set this meeting up, what would you have to do? What would you have to do? You'd have to talk you to have, somebody in PR. You might have to talk to, but you have to send an email. You have to send an email, try to get in contact right, so with a that, representative that represents so, you. So that takes writing something down, doesn't it? Yep. I'll rest my case. Please continue. <laughs> anyway, there's a lot more to Protect. the work that we do. Um, and yeah, Sunny is dyslexic, but I've always seen that as one of the most beautiful things about him is um, he works his mind works in a very different way, you know, I feel that like I'm very in the box and Sonny just thinks outside of the box, which is great, but at times it can point. mean that I want to kill him, like literally kill him. Uh, and that's why I'm really lucky that I live with his uh, parents, my in-laws, because I can get some space <laughs> away from him. Because when you're living, working together, and, and don't forget we are still husband and wife, uh, it's really important, you know, to take some time out. Yeah, take it what you want, man. I'm still. He good. has no friends. I have a lot of friends. So he just, you know, goes to the cinema by himself. I get time out and go, and you know, I have a social life, and I do that. Hey, listen, <laughs> adventure time. There's a lot of catching up to do with all this brilliant stuff on, the on, on the internet, Simpsons. <laughs> so yeah. you know, I'm a big fan of cartoon and anime. But seriously, how do you feel working with me? Like, come on. And as I was saying, it's like sometimes, you know, you need that space from that voice in your head, and <laughs> you realise it's not a voice in your head; it's someone sitting next to you. That's like really rude. You should be like, my wife is amazing, she does everything. So if you know that, then why do I have to say it? You should say that. She's amazing. She's just uh, mind blast. Mind blast! <laughs>
at what's happening uh, locally, then nationally, and then worldwide. That's how we pick on how we're going to do our throw out. Throw out meaning the question we're going to ask. One of the most controversial or one of the ones that had the biggest um, impact on our show was we asked a question about the burqa and if the burqa should be banned within the United Kingdom because of the threats that were posed prior to Christmas. Now, me and Shay, we are facilitators, so we will ask the question, but in that respect, we will then get our research team in the BBC, which BBC has to be non-partial. They, they don't take sides, and this is something that we have to they do. have to be partial. Yeah, we have to be partial, sorry. And so as a result, we have to do the research. We have to find out for and against both of those arguments. And we'll get on the guests that are pro and con. Mm. And that was sparked purely because one caller phoned in yeah. and said something that was his opinion, which we respect, like it or not, is a freedom of speech. But we said we could not continue that show with that kind of behavior, but we will come to that question. And we gave him that respect and we had a conversation about it. That same caller phoned in and said, thank you, I, I was, I'm enlightened now. Mm. So that caller itself sparked the the subject of the burqa and as a result you do we believe that if you're being respectful and no one's swearing and everyone's being conversational then you should give them their respect and listen to their point of view and you don't have to agree with their point of view but you must give them that respect because dialogue is the way to stop wars and to move forward and if you if someone's standing there with a gun in your face if you can talk them out of it instead of reaching for yours who, whoever's the mm. fastest on the trigger will win that day so conversation is very important and I think conflict that is happening in our, in our world today can be resolved if we are willing and our world leaders are willing to have conversations with people that we shouldn't be talking to out, out of principle but if it's going to save lives I think everything can be happening. So yeah, I mean we do a lot of, like Sonny says, international but you know from a, from a perspective of, you know, as a woman I think one of the most powerful interviews that I did um, was in 2014 actually where I met with um, a woman who was a victim of child sex trafficking. She was from Nepal. And um, I just, you know, meeting her one-on-one -on -one and hearing her story about how she was duped into eating, well, she just had matiai, she had ludu, and she was with her family. And just having that one ludu changed her whole life and she was duped into going to um, Mumbai and she was unfortunately um, a child sex slave for nearly nine years of her life and luckily for her she was rescued um, but there are so many you know hundreds of thousands of young girls who unfortunately um, are not rescued and I think that one interview is one that will stay with me um, you know as a woman it's it's so terrible when you hear stories like that and I feel very privileged to live in a society in a world where fortunately it doesn't happen as much. Um, I think that was one, but in terms of the topics, I have a degree in sociology and I really have a passion about understanding society. So, you know, we will talk about anything which affects the local community that is Asian, black, white, European, you know, non-European, it affects everyone. Then on our BBC London show, we do try to focus on topics which we feel are taboo, topics which our community, the South Asian community, that's the Indian, Pakistani, Bangladeshi community, Tamil. don't want to, yeah, Tamil, Sri Lankan, don't want to talk about. That can be anything from, you know, homosexuality, right through to the caste system, uh, right through to being vegetarian, right through to uh, mixed relationships, anything and everything, you know, there's no bars hold in, in, in the types of topics that we choose. No but, problem. yeah, no holds bar. But, I have to say, if you haven't heard our religion, we do also do the light stuff as well. We do entertaining mm. stories and um, it's, it's about having that balance. You know, you can't be really sad and, you know, have really sad topics all the time. Because that's life, right? Yeah. So it comes with its Highs shades and of lows. Grief. Yeah. And so we always do that. So, you know, we could go from talking about something like, I don't know, a taboo topic. It, um, and then we could move right into talking about, you know, film and Hindi film. We're the brand ambassadors for London Indian Film Festival. So we were very lucky uh, last year to host the Q&A with Julian Anderson. Uh, so we, we do quite a lot, don't we? Well, yeah, yeah. and this, this is, and we only take on projects or we spend time on stuff that really interests us. And it's not always for the best ratings or uh, yeah. this might be good for your career if you speak to this person. Uh, for, for example, some of the stuff that we see on YouTube and online and, 
and they've got like what like uh, I, I can mention one guy his name is inquisitive he mm. had about 200 followers uh, on his Instagram when we when we first saw his imagery of uh, depicting the gurus and we fell in love with that guy yeah. and uh, because of the way he you know did his artwork and um, so we invited him to our show on BBC and uh, and no one heard of him at that point and he was just heading out to Canada and Toronto his first tour first yeah. tour and uh, when he came back he was getting more exposure which we were so happy for and now he's you know he's on another platform where he is actually spreading that kind of work, art and he's growing as an artist mm -hmm. and uh, and you know we are thinking you know what we should speak to people like him we feel really lucky i think the easiest way to describe it is we remember there being a time when we were knocking on doors and you know, no, no, one was, no one was listening. And we feel that like we now have an opportunity um, to speak to anyone who's really big, but also someone who's really, you know, not known to say, look, this is our platform. If you have something to talk about, whether that is about your art, your music, your creativity, uh, or perhaps something that has happened to you, which you feel is important to talk about on our radio show, then we really do use that as an opportunity to invite those people on. And we are saying if someone who's seriously into their into their preferred yeah their profession profession or, yeah. it's not like you know you go to work and you think oh you know I fancy doing a bit of DJing and then you turn <laughs> up like, I've got a mix man yeah, you're gonna be doing? passionate you're, you're gonna, gonna be passionate be yeah. yeah and. Uh, so yeah, that's basically on on the on the front of our. We, we, that's how we balance our hard stories and how they are chosen.